Hello everyone. Welcome to Melbourne Conversations, Drug Use Happens, Stories About Drugs and Alcohol. It's brought to you by Melbourne Conversations, which is the City of Melbourne's program of free public talks and forums as part of National Youth Week and in association with Future Leaders and Federation Square. Really what I was thinking was, how would you normally start a meeting about drugs? So I watch a lot of television, I watch a lot of movies, and I thought, really, I should probably start it in the standard way. So let's pretend I haven't spoken to you yet. I'm now just standing up for the first time, and I'm going to say, hello, my name is Leslie, and I'm a drug user. And you guys are supposed to say what? That's right. That's right. See, we all watch a lot of television and a lot of movies. That's right. So I'll just say that. You guys will do your bit, and then we'll go on. Hello, my name is Leslie, and I'm a drug user. Hi, everyone. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about my drug using. I use alcohol, uh, mostly socially. Um, I occasionally actually even smoke a social cigarette. Um, and I may have, um, well, I might have, um, I might have maybe smoked um, marijuana, but I didn't inhale. Um, and of course, it's all pretty touchy, isn't it? I mean, I probably could tell you more, but I won't, because it's pretty touchy, isn't it? Because on the one hand, what we want to do here tonight is we want to talk honestly and openly about drugs. And one of the things we want to talk about is how to use drugs if you're going to use them safely, harm minimization. But it's absolutely, but it's difficult, isn't it? Because some drugs are not legal. And so it's definitely not going to minimize your harm to end up in jail. So constantly in these conversations, we have those conflicts, and we're going to try to talk about those tonight and maybe hopefully work through a few of them. Um, and the other thing we're probably going to talk a little bit about is that notion of harm. How consistently do we use it? So I thought it might be good to do a quick little survey, so it's going to be really quick, but I'm going to read out eight different kinds of drugs, legal and illegal, so I'll read out the list quickly, and so you can hear all the ones that are going to be on it. There's going to be eight. And then I'm going to ask you to raise your hand when I get to the one on the list, because I'll read it again, that you think is the most dangerous. OK, and by dangerous, what I mean is that it causes the most harm to the user of the drug and to society. So it's like a composite sort of figure. Most danger to the user, most danger to society. That's the one you'd say was the most dangerous. OK, so here's the list of eight. Cocaine, cannabis, crack cocaine, alcohol, tobacco, heroin, methamphetamine, and amphetamine. Those are your choices. Do you want me to read it again? No, you're across it. OK. So I'm going to go through the list now one by one. And if you think that's the one that's the most dangerous, raise your hand. OK, who thinks cocaine's the most dangerous? No one. No one. Don't be shy. You're going to have to put your hand up at some point. Cannabis. No one. OK. Crack cocaine. Most dangerous. OK, we got one over here. Anyone else? Don't be shy, saw a hand, nearly no, OK? Alcohol. Woohoo! gosh, we're smart in here. Is this a rigged audience? Tobacco. OK, good. Heroin. Yep, a few. OK, good. Methamphetamine. OK, and amphetamine. OK, so the big four, the big four guesses for the number one most dangerous were alcohol, tobacco, and what was the other one? Heroin and methamphetamine. Is that right? OK, now we're going to find out the answer. Drum roll, please. What is, in fact, the most dangerous drug? It's alcohol. It's alcohol. Alcohol actually, far and away, is the most dangerous drug. If you put together danger to the user and danger to others. Interesting, isn't it? Because what you'd think is we would have some kind of calibration in the way that we regulate drugs. 
and that we would ha be taking into account harm as one of the things we consider when we think about how to regulate. And of course, we have regulations that range all the way from um, you know, restricting people's access via age to alcohol, for instance, all the way to making a drug just simply illegal. And nobody can use it for any reason at any time without breaking the law. But clearly, harm is not the way in which we're doing that, or else alcohol, presumably, would be on the banned list, and it's not. And again, we're going to talk a little bit about this tonight with people who know far more about me and understand far better than me why that's the case, because I'm curious as hell. We're also going to talk a little bit about use and abuse. So again, you all seem to be television and movie watchers. You probably know that when drugs are depicted, talked about, when we see people who use drugs, we very rarely see someone who is not an abuser of drugs. We very rarely see users, certainly not of illegal drugs. We see users of legal drugs like alcohol, but we very rarely see users of illegal drugs who are anything but abusers. So is that really true? Is there any way to use drugs and not be an abuser? How can that be done? Again, our panel's going to give us some of the answers. And finally, the last thing I want to say before I want to bring people up to the stage and, and get that conversation going is I want people to understand that we're going to be talking about drug use tonight, we're going to be talking about legal and illegal use, but I don't want anyone to feel like you have to be using drugs or you're totally not cool. That's definitely not the conversation we're going to be having. Some people do, some people don't, some people use some, they don't use others. You're not obligated to use them, but part of the conversation we're going to be having here is if you do use them, what are the consequences, what are the benefits, what are the harms, how can you use it safely, all that's going to be talked about tonight. So thanks very much for your attention, and now what we're going to do is bring our lovely panel up here. So first, I'd like to ask Professor Andrew Lawrence. Can you come up? Andrew's the head of the Addiction Neuroscience and Research Fellow within the Behavioral Neuroscience Division at the Florey Neuroscience Institute. Can we say neuroscience again? I don't think so. I want to bring Lisa up. Lisa Pryor, come on up. Lisa's a journalist, a writer, and a medical student. I want to bring Min up. Min, come on up. Min Diapoli, who's our, our token youth. Here she is, our young person. Um, and Peter Wern. Peter Wern is the Director of Services, Youth Support and Advocacy Service and the Vice President Trust for Young Australians. So I want to start off by asking um, Professor Andrew Lawrence to come and speak to us um, a little bit about everything he knows by being the head of the Addiction Neuroscience and Research Fellow within the Behavioural Neuroscience Division at Fleury Neuroscience Institute. And I can tell you we were talking a little bit beforehand and Andrew knows a hell of a lot. So can I welcome him up? Well, uh, good evening. And uh, I'd just like to thank the organizers for um, inviting me to come and, and speak at this event. It's, it's not the typical kind of event that I would come and speak at, but I hope it's going to be a very enjoyable experience. I'm, I'm a neuroscientist, so my interest is working out what happens in the brain when you use drugs and become addicted to drugs? But clearly, not everybody that uses drugs becomes addicted to drugs. And in fact, the minority of drug users actually become addicted. Nevertheless, I think it's really very important for people to understand from a scientific perspective, uh, we do not see addiction as a moral issue or as a moral weakness or a moral character flaw. We see it as a brain disorder, just as Huntington's disease is a brain disorder, or just as Parkinson's disease is a brain disorder. It's quite clearly to us a brain disorder. Everybody can think of somebody they know that smokes and has repeatedly tried and failed to stop smoking. Nobody believes they have some kind of character flaw because they're you know, not, not capable of stopping smoking. They just say, oh, bad luck, better luck next time. If, however, you knew someone who was an intravenous drug user who repeatedly tried to stop but failed to do so, most people would think that's just a bum, they've got a character flaw, sort themselves out. Well, the, the two examples are identical in many respects, certainly in terms of the adaptations that occur in your brain when you use drugs chronically. And so the, dish, the, 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 the only differentiation is that nicotine is a legal drug through cigarettes, whereas uh, an intravenous drug user is typically using illegal drugs. But your brain doesn't know whether the drug you are using is legal or illegal. And therefore, to me, there's no argument other than the fact that addiction is quite clearly a brain disorder. It's a medical condition and uh, no other issue. 
that's quite clear from imaging studies. Structural and functional changes occur in the brains of drug users. It's clear from genetics as well. It's, it, the genetics of addiction are complex. Huntington's disease that I brought up before has very simple genetics. It's a single gene disorder. Uh, cystic fibrosis is a single gene disorder, for example. There are many genes that are implicated to varying degrees in susceptibility to addiction, but susceptibility is being the key issue here. And, and not only is it genetic, because uh, there are also environmental interactions with your genetic makeup. So you may have a genetic susceptibility on the one hand to becoming an addict, but you need to be put in the appropriate or inappropriate environment often for that to actually be noted uh, in, in the outcome. We spoke a bit about, or it was mentioned before about, uh, you know, drug use being prevalent, but not everybody uh, becoming addicted, but even so there being sub substantial harms potentially for people using drugs. Now those harms are, are significant and they cost Australian society over $50 billion a year. So it's not only is it, is, it a, is it a community problem, is it a social problem, it's a public health problem, it's an economic problem. So in many, many guises, it's a big problem. Other speakers are going to talk to us tonight about uh, ages when drug use commences or doesn't commence and the notions around that. That can differ for, for different um, drugs as well. We have a strong interest in looking at uh, modelling inhalant abuse, because inhalant abuse typically occurs in quite young people before any other drug use. And, and that's important because the, when, when drug use commences when people are young, even, even if it's not in the majority of cases, the brain and the nervous system are still maturing. And because it's still maturing, we, we believe it's particularly vulnerable to insults and toxic insults in particular that can cause uh, substantial damage that, that may be difficult to recover. Um, the important thing is, though, as well, that you mustn't just go away with the idea that drug use is an adolescent, teenage, young adult thing that occurs between 15 and 28. It, it persists for a, for a lot of people through a lot of their lifetime. And in fact, there are reasonably good estimates now that those people aged 50 years and, uh, and over that actively seek assistance for drug substance abuse problems is likely to double in the next 10 to 15 years. So you see, drug use and problem drug use is not only a, a problem of young people, it's a problem with people across the different age spans. Okay, so I mentioned to you that I'm, I'm a neuroscientist, I'm not a clinician, uh, I don't work in the treatment sector, and so what, what do I do that's got any relevance to drug use and addiction? Well, my laboratory looks into doing experiments on animals, uh, and doing experiments on animals to mimic drug use in humans and to develop models of addiction in animals. So why do we do that? Well, we do that because the only way you can really truly understand the molecular mechanisms that occur in the brain in that transition from casual drug use through to compulsive and maybe dependent drug use is to be able to uh, interrogate systems in a way that you really can't do in, in, a, in a living human system. And therefore, we do it in animals. Now, I will just remind everyone at this point in time, I'm also the chair of the Animal Ethics Committee at the Institute, and an, all of our experiments, the welfare of the animal is of the utmost priority. However, it may surprise you that any, think of any drug that humans willingly voluntarily take, you can train animals to do exactly the same thing, whether it's nicotine, alcohol, cocaine, heroin, ecstasy, amphetamine, methamphetamine, you name it, you can train an animal to self-administer voluntarily any of those drugs. Now that's important because that gives the model some kind of face validity. Now not only will they voluntarily self-administer drugs, but we can treat those animals with medications that are used in the human clinic and they will reduce self-administration of drugs in animals. Therefore, these models have what we call predictive validity. And what that means is that if you're trying to develop new pharmacotherapeutic strategies, you've got a model that you can test whether or not these compounds have some kind of efficacy or not. Now, perhaps the most important point is that these models have good construct validity as well. And what that means is these animals will self-administer until they become addicted, but not all of them just like in the human case. You could take 100 rats, for example, and train them to self-administer cocaine. They could take as much cocaine as they wanted. And what you will find with time, 
as the weeks progress, that they basically separate out into two groups of animals. You will get one group of animals, which is the majority, around about 80 to 85 percent, that will titrate a relatively low level of drug use, but it's stable. They will use this similar amount of drug day after day after day after day. Then you'll get a second subpopulation of animals, which is about 15 to 17 or so percent, 15 to 20 percent. And what they will do over time is escalate their drug use so that they will take more and more and more and more drug as time goes on. Not only will they do that, but they will be prepared to work harder and harder and harder for that drug use. And if we take diagnostic criteria, such as those that are imposed on, the human, uh, on human drug users, we can actually identify subpopulations of animals that we call, we can't say they're addicted because addiction's a human disease, but we say they're uh, addiction vulnerable versus the majority of animals which are addiction resilient. So therefore, we have actually a very powerful way of, of modeling addiction through voluntary self-administration. It's not coercive, the animals consume as much cocaine as they choose. Uh, and for example, uh, you could do it with another drug, but cocaine's the example I'm running with at the moment. And they become what we think is as close to becoming addicted as you could have in an animal. Now, that's very important. So what actually happens in the brain when these animals are taking these drugs? Well, we know that drug use and long-term drug use, particularly psychostimulant drug use, impacts the, the ability of certain parts of the brain to function properly and particularly parts of the brain involved in decision making. And therefore, when we tell people to make good decisions, make the right decision, don't make the wrong decision, and don't use drugs, you make, the, make a good decision and not use drugs, it's actually very difficult to tell people in that situation to make the right decision because the part of their brain that is driving that decision making process has its function impaired. So they may want to make the right decision, but they may not be able to make the right decision. So that's a very important thing to remember. It's very easy to tell someone to go away and do something, and they may have all the will in the world to want to do it, but they may not be capable of doing it because of an impairment in, in uh, the function of certain circuits in the brain. So what do we find out, uh, or what do people find out in general doing experiments on animals of that nature? So we know that we, you can take, take those 100 animals and they, they're self-administering cocaine. After Two, two and a half to three weeks, their ability to make these decisions, this, this part of the brain ceases to work properly. That happens in 100% of the animals across the board. However, the distinction is that in the majority of the animals that carry on using drugs and do, the ones that do not escalate, the ones that just maintain that stable ability to uh, titrate their drug usage, the functioning of that part of the brain somehow recovers, it comes back to how it was before they started using drugs. However, for the animals that we call the addicted animals or the addiction vulnerable animals, that part of the brain continues not to work properly. So you see, there's something that differentiates the majority of these animals from the minority of the animals in the ability for this drug-induced impairment, if you like, to recover. So it would suggest that most of us have some inbuilt recovery mechanism that can, even though we will all to one degree or another, potentially suffer some drug-induced impairment in brain function. But for the majority of people, that impairment will recover, even if drug use is continued. But for the minority of people that become addicted, that brain function will continue to be impaired, and they are the people that presumably are going to become addicted and transition into dependent use. Now that's, that's a real problem because you may think, well, the odds are on my side because you know, you know, only about 15% of people that use drug X are gonna become addicted. But the thing is, you don't know which side you're gonna fall into. And so when I've given talks at schools, which I have done, uh, it's like playing Russian roulette. You know, I can say to people, if, if I put two lines of white powder on the table and said, well, here's some cocaine, take it, be my guest. Some, there'd be a number of people in the crowd that would get up and willingly take it, and they may have no, no consequence of that whatsoever. But other people may take it, and it may be the initiation of becoming addicted. So while some people would do that, if I put a gun on the table with a bullet in, the, in one chamber and said, hey, hey, okay, come along, who fancies a go at Russian roulette? I don't think there'd be too many takers. But you see, from a neurobiological perspective, 
that's exactly what it is. It's Russian roulette. And, you know, some people are happy to play Russian roulette and some people are not. Okay, I'll just finish off with, uh, with a treatment, a uh, bit about treatment. Treatment is very difficult. It's complicated because there are a number of confounding factors. Uh, people may have health issues as a consequence of their drug use. For example, liver dysfunction may impair the kind of drugs people can use. Uh, people may have other comorbid disorders that complicate treatment and complicate treatment compliance. Um, and um, it, it, it is very difficult. The other thing is that when you're developing drugs that work in the brain, it's very difficult to have a drug that doesn't have side effects because the brain is a network that's wired together. So affecting the activity in one or two structures is going to have knock-on effects elsewhere. However, there are also potentially non-drug treatment options such as uh, extinction, uh, reconsolidation, memory, memory type training problems, cognitive behavioural therapies, or combinations of the two. Just to very quickly finish off, I, I've been involved with a drug company in the States as a consultant contractor, developing a, a, a compound that started out from an ancient herbal Chinese remedy. And what happened was the active ingredient was isolated, the structure was elucidated, and, and a series of analogues on that structure was synthesised. And, and I consulted on that process and I tested uh, a range of different uh, formulations and different compounds. And we've actually got to a stage now where, where the final lead compound is going into human trials, which is, which is very, very comforting. It may never make it, but it, that demonstrates to you that you can take an ancient remedy that has a number of issues and actually bring it back or bring it forwards into, into modern day, deconstruct the remedy, and then, and then go forwards with, with an active single ingredient that may be useful in some people. And I think the, thing, the last thing I will finish on really quickly is that you don't need to have the impression that there's a one-size-fits-all treatment because some treatments may work for some people but not for others, and that's why we need a suite of options available to us. I'll finish on that. That was fascinating. I've got heaps of questions for him afterwards. I might have to sit in the hot seat myself. Um, next, we've got Lisa Pryor. Lisa's a journalist, a writer, and a medical student. And she's the author of two books, non-fiction books. The first one's called The Pinstriped Prison, How Overachievers Get Trapped in Corporate Jobs. And most recently, her new book, which I've got a copy of here, a small book about drugs. Um, and apparently, there's some order forms floating around somewhere if you want to order it. Um, and I've had a bit of a look at it, and it really is quite an interesting book if you're interested in that sort of thing. So Lisa, can you come up and talk to us, please? Thanks, Leslie. Uh, I completely agree. Andrew's talk was very interesting and well-informed. Uh, and I'm coming from this topic from a different perspective, hopefully not um, in that I'll be uninteresting and uninformed, but just the different perspective that I'm uh, interested in this topic from a personal perspective, which is that I am someone who has used recreational drugs recreationally through the course of my teens and 20s without serious ill effect or uh, without... Uh, uh, serious damage to my life or without facing addiction. I want to make the point that that does not in any way mean that what I have to say is in contradiction to what Andrew says. In fact, both points of view are true. It is true that drugs destroy lives and lead to addiction. It's also true that drugs can be fun and any discussion of how to minimise harm, I believe, has to start with those two perspectives. Uh, with events like this, whether I'm in the audience or whether I'm speaking, my favourite bit by far is always the interactive bit at the end. So I'm going to try and be really brief and leave as much time as possible for chatting at the end. I just want to make four quick points about teenagers and drugs, given that this is Youth Week. The first point is that teenagers are not the age group most likely to be taking drugs. Plenty do, of course. I first tried pot when I was 14, so I'm well aware that it that drug use does happen amongst teenagers. At the same time, I think it's really important to point out that most teenagers don't take drugs so that young people don't get the idea that somehow you're not having the full teenage experience if you're not experimenting with illicit substances. Uh, to give you the figures, less than a quarter of people aged 14 to 19 have tried an illicit substance uh, compared to more than half of people in their 20s. So, it's uh, really older people who are hitting it pretty hard, uh, not the young ones. And it's not in any way inevitable that you have to try drugs to have a full teenage life. 
The second point I'd like to make is that we need to find a language to talk about to young people about making drug use as safe as possible without fearing that we can't say anything without encouraging it. I feel like over the, my drug taking career, looking at friends around me who have also been taking drugs, it feels like people have learned by trial and error during the course of their 20s how to stay relatively safe. So that by the time you're 30, you're sort of a fairly sensible person. It'd be great if people could start out when they first try things when they're 18 or 20 with some of the folkloric knowledge of, of how to stay relatively safe rather than having to learn by making mistakes. Just little tiny things like, for example, if you are going to take a pill, uh, try not to take it all at once. Why not take half, wait an hour, see how it goes, and if it's disastrous, it means you've only taken half, and if it's good, you can take the other half. Uh, that, that's no guarantee of safety. Things could still go terribly wrong, but uh, as someone's pointed out to me, it's, you can always take more, but you can't untake a pill once you've taken it. So uh, you may as well play it safe. Uh, another example is I, I, it's really important with a group of friends to, to develop an ethos of safety uh, when it comes to going out and partying and to, 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 have, to know that you have a duty as a human being to always call an ambulance for someone if they're, in, uh, if they're unconscious or you can't rouse them or they're very sick and that that uh, huge duty as a human being has to override any fear you have of getting into trouble. And that's absolutely vital. Thankfully, I've never been in a position where I've had to call an ambulance for someone, but it's important to know what you would do if you were in that position. The third point I wanted to make is that one of the challenges in, in having these conversations with young people about how to say, reduce harm with drug taking is that there's often two kinds of harm we're talking about. One is harm in terms of damage to your health, and the other is harm in terms of getting in trouble with the law. And sometimes, staying, sometimes these two are in conflict. I just wanted to give a, an example of that. Consider what is the safest place to take an illicit substance? I would say in terms of staying, protecting your health, one of the best places might be an organised dance party or small music festival where there are medical professionals on site, there's first aid, security, and if someone collapses, for example, they're going to get help straight away. That is also the least safe place, though, uh, to take drugs if you're worried about getting in trouble with the law, uh, because they're riddled with undercover police often, there's uh, sniffer doors out the front, sniffer dogs out the front, and there's a fair chance, uh, a small chance, but a fair chance that you, you might get caught, end up with a criminal record, get expelled from your school, uh, and face all these consequences that can have a serious impact on your life. I'm kind of... I, feel like as well that that is uh, often thinking of people I know sometimes the most serious impact on people's life of drugs is getting caught effectively uh, I think how lucky I am I have led the most wholesome goody two shoes life on the outside you know went to a private girls school I was a prefect you know went to university I think of how different my life would have panned out if I'd got caught for some of the stuff I was doing along the way uh, I think my life could have turned out very differently uh, yeah, so it's a, a difficult one, balancing those two forms of harm. Uh, finally, I just wanted to address the, the challenge that people like me are going to have. I'm a parent now, and one day my children are going to be teenagers. The, the problem that an increasing number of parents have when they've taken drugs themselves, uh, they have this issue of what, how they're going to deal, discuss these issues with their own children when they're teenagers. And one thing I've, I know that I'm going to say to my uh, kids when they are teenagers is that in life, you're going to meet people who tried drugs and they're happy for having had that experience. You're also going to meet people who have tried drugs and wish they'd never touched them. But you will never, ever, very rarely meet anyone who wishes they'd tried drugs at a younger age. So that even if you're considering taking drugs, put it off as long as possible. There's always going to be another chance around the corner. Wait till you're 18, wait till you're 20, wait till you're 25 even. Uh, don't do it young when your brain is still so vulnerable and... Uh, you don't even have to do it all if you don't want. Uh, thanks very much.
That's such an important story um, and message, Lisa, about calling an ambulance. Um, we had an experience in our own family where a young boy that we knew, um, he would have died if the kids had not realised that they were going to be in far more trouble with this kid's parents if they didn't call an ambulance and he died than if they did, and they actually saved his life. So it's just probably the most important message in the world for kids, isn't it, that you must call an ambulance. Um, the next, well, now we're going to speak to our young person. So Min, Min DiNapoli um, is a year 12 student, environment captain at Melbourne Girls College and has been an active member of the Australian Youth Climate Coalition since 2009. She is also a former star of a previous Melbourne conversation where she hit the hot seat and was an explosive success. And now you see where that can lead you, which is right up here on the podium. So, so pay, pay attention. Um, Min, please come up and talk to us about your experience. I quite like being 17. I'm almost legally an adult, um, and I've generally established enough age points to be taken seriously. When I was 16, I felt really young, and 18 seems like it carries some hefty responsibilities. When I was asked to be a panellist, two thoughts occurred to me. One was that I was going to need to get on urbandictionary.com and look up my drug slang, so it looked like I knew everything I was to know about drugs, and the other thing was, were my parents going to be invited? And for the record, they're not here. <laughs> Once I understood that I probably wasn't going to be able to learn all the 43 common words for marijuana, I thought it was probably better to take a different approach. So in all honesty, I'm going to try and give you an insight into my contact with drug and, drugs and alcohol, which, as you might have gathered, I'm not very hardcore. Um, actually, within my group, I'm the weird one. I think it should be clarified first that not all young people are swallowing vodka six, swallowing vodka six packs and taking ease at the club every Friday night. In fact, a very small proportion of under 18s have swallowed anything more sinister than an aspirin. And as we've heard from Lisa already, the whole kind of slippery slope argument is a bit ridiculous. Sensationalist news programs, which shall not be named, um, will give you all sorts of notions about what your kids are getting up to behind your back and how, in fact, caffeine is a gateway drug, and it's not. <laughs> Drinking, on the other hand, is almost compulsory. What I've seen happen in people I know is that gradually personal concessions are made, standards are eroded, expectations allowed to shift. The first time you tell yourself, oh, I'll go to their parties, but I won't touch their alcohol, but something happens. Maybe it's that you're desperate to be kissed, or you want to know what all the fuss is about, or maybe you're just bored. But I would say now that most of my friends drink at least every other weekend. Some of them have gone further. All right, I'll drink their alcohol, but I won't touch their weed. And they break that resolution. You turn into a relativist. I mean, really, it's only weed. And you can see how easy it is for alcohol and drugs to give relativism a bad name. Peer pressure is real. It's not something we left behind in primary school. Nothing is said. Everything is implied. If you want to join the circle, you do what people do. Suddenly, as a non-drinker and a non-drug taker, I'm outside social convention. No longer is Abstaining from alcohol and drugs a cool thing to do, but you find that the Facebook invitations are slowly diminishing. And it's not what you think. People aren't doing it to be malicious, but actually to be kind. They genuinely think they're saving you from some kind of painful experience, that if, you, if I went to their parties and didn't drink, I wouldn't have any fun. Because no one can have fun without alcohol, can they? On the flip side, I know people who can't stand others who drink or take drugs. That was me a couple of years ago. Then I went to France, drank an awful lot of beer at German pubs, and watched people go seriously out of it at parties. By the time I came home, I had just decided that it wasn't for me. So there you have it, I'm a quitter at the ripe old age of 17. Now, <laughs> what bothers me about some of my peers' relationships with alcohol and drugs is that they don't think about it at all. 
whether, they, whether or not they partake, they either condemn everyone who does it or they stigmatise everyone who doesn't. Drugs and alcohol don't really carry any moral value in themselves, and I think that any absolute value judgments either way are going to be dangerous. The people who know exactly where they stand on every single issue are more often than not the closed-minded morons. So, from a non-drinking, non-drugging perspective, I can see that people choose drugs and alcohol for many reasons. As I've said already, the social pressure is enormous. You understandably want to fit in with your friends, to impress someone or to prove to people that you're not boring. I guarantee that at every party I go to, I'm either offered a drink or I'm asked constantly why I'm not drinking. And let me tell you, watching drunk people say or do absurd things can either be truly hilarious or insanely boring, depending on your mood. For others, the usual pressures of school and family to succeed academically and to know exactly what you want to do the rest of your life. Alcohol and drugs present themselves as a way of escaping. You, for you can forget everything and just have fun. Of course, some people are curious about the sensations that alcohol and drugs can give them. Some want to be someone else for a while. Others get thrilled thrills from the forbidden nature of the whole business. But when I asked some of my friends why they did it, by far the most common answer was, why not? I've always thought that you should find reasons to do something, not reasons not to do something, but I guess this is going to be different for everyone. Then there's the issue of what will happen in the future. As it's been said already tonight, teenagers are the ones at the greatest risk of damaging their health in the long term. The problem is, society as a whole promotes a don't think, live in the moment kind of culture, and teenagers tend to believe it and think that they're untouchable. Young people expect to be fed new information constantly, and while we can understand and empathise with a news story or campaign, we're also likely to forget it quickly. If we see a shocking statistic about, on a web page about drink driving, for example, it will register on our short-term consciousness, but it's unlikely to have any lasting impact unless we have a personal connection to the issue. We're far more likely to connect with TV shows that promote stereotypes of teenagehood, especially the work hard, play hard characters. I've been thinking a fair bit about the issues of decriminalisation, legalisation and harm minimisation. That's a lot of T-I-O-N endings. Um, and I'm still not entirely sure about where I stand. What I think is important to keep in mind, whatever we do, is to ensure that we're looking out for people and positive health outcomes. What is obvious to me is that the debate needs to be raised to a level where we can discuss the issues out in the open without making the immediate assumption that all drugs are terrible all the time. I think that people have very limited access to reliable information about health risks, especially when mixing drugs. Legal prohibition has absolutely zero influence on anyone who has any familiarity with drug use, and so is in effect completely ignored. This leaves only friends, other drug users, and the internet as sources of information. And all the evidence from these sources is anecdotal or else it's hard to sift out the anecdotal from the scientific. This is what is exposing my friends to all kinds of unnecessary risks. At the moment, I like feeling in control of myself, and I do that by staying sober. If I can retain that feeling by using alcohol, and maybe drugs someday, that'll be okay too. That's how I'll know what I'm doing is right for me. Thank you. Thanks, Vin. Now, last but not least, we have Mr. Peter Wern. Peter is the Director of Services, Youth Support and Advocacy Service and Vice President, Trust for Young Australians. He is also the founder of St Kilda Youth Services, which I wanted to say as a resident of St Kilda is an extraordinarily important and successful um, 
partnership in our community that really makes living in St Kilda a great place to be. So Peter, um, I w welcome you to the stage and please tell us about your experience. Look, it's uh, a privilege to be here tonight and uh, I haven't got a lot of notes and there's an advantage in uh, speaking last. Um, although this is a somewhat daunting task in this case. Um, firstly, I'd like to say that uh, the things I'm going to talk about are more around cultural and societal, if you like, a philosophical approach to the issues that we've been talking about tonight. Every young person that I've ever met that's been involved with drug use has been from a particular part of our community, and that is the community that was talked about before, that can't leave a line of cocaine or a syringe full of heroin or cannabis or alcohol alone. The service that I work for typically sees young people who are using three or four drugs every week, either independently or together, and are intoxicated 18 to 20 hours a day every day of the week, every week of the year. The only time they are not intoxicated is when they are in a withdrawal unit or they are incarcerated. And on leaving incarceration or that withdrawal unit, the temptation for them to go back to that behaviour and that lifestyle is profound, almost overwhelmingly profound. If you'd have asked any of these young people when they were little, three, four, five, I'm, um, I'm not that old, but I used to be that old. And when I was little, they used to ask me, Peter, what would you like to do when you grow up? Well, I wanted to play test cricket for Australia. I also wanted to play league football, and I wanted to earn a lot of money and have a really nice car. I, I had a lot of things I wanted to do. But I don't ever remember thinking that one of my ambitions was to end up homeless, penniless, destitute, full of all sorts of issues and problems and dependent on a drug. I don't think there's a child in Australia when asked the question, what do you want to be when you grow up, answers, I want to be a drug addict. This is not a choice. This is not something people choose for themselves as their future. This is a complicated issue, as has been demonstrated by many of the speakers tonight, that requires our best thinking, our best evidence, but most of all our best endeavours to do something about and to assist young people in doing something about, not just for them, but with them. Tonight we've had the pleasure of hearing a very articulate young woman speak. My experience of young people in this country is that we have a lot to be proud of with the current generation of, of adolescents and teenagers. And yet if you read the popular media, you would think that they are the greatest curse and the greatest scourge that have ever hit the planet. Well, they said that about my generation. They were probably more right about my generation if I'm typical. They probably said it about generations that have gone on for hundreds of years. The truth is, we have a generation of young people that live amongst us that we are to embrace and we are to applaud and we can be absolutely sure that they are going to make the best fist of it in making the world a better place to live in after they leave and when they become adults and when they have more responsibility. So the group of people I'm most concerned about is the young people that we discard, is the young people we say aren't good enough, the one young people we say have made bad choices, the young people we say, really, you just have to do better. It is all your fault. Recently, we ran a uh, focus group with the Victorian Alcohol and Other Drug Association of young people where they were canvassed around their uh, views on, on drugs and alcohol and government and policy and things like that. One of our staff members sat with 15 young people who were involved in, the treat, in our treatment service while they were going through this focus group. The great sadness of what came out of that focus group was not that these young people had a history 
of incredible pain and incredible suffering. But when asked about their life, they said, we're losers, we're useless, it's all our fault. No one told me I had to take a drug. It's all down to me. I'm just a failure. I don't know where you sit with that, but when I heard that, I wept. 17, 18 year olds thinking that their whole life is worthless and it's absolutely all their fault. How have they got to that point? Here's what I'd like to see happen. I'd like us to understand that all drug use has a purpose and meaning and function. And there are lots of harms associated with it and there are lots of perils associated with it. But people don't do it for no reason. And for many of the young people that end up in our treatment sector, they do it because they have been victims of neglect, abuse and harm in their early life. A parent once rung me and said after her young daughter had been asked to leave one of our residential withdrawal units and she said to me, you know, the drugs have completely destroyed my daughter's life. She was very angry that her daughter had been asked to leave, but she was really, really in despair. And we asked her, we said, tell us about your daughter. Tell us about when you first noticed that this that your child was struggling. And do you know what she said? Oh, when she was about five years of age, blah, blah, blah. We pointed out to the mum, she wasn't using drugs when she was five years of age. And in that moment of reflection, the parents saw, whatever has gone on, I see the drug, but I don't see what's going on with my daughter. There's something bigger happening here. There's a backstory to all these kids' lives. And the backstory is powerful, but the backstory is a story that the community that they live in has to partly own. So we bear responsibility for our neighbours' children, for our neighbours' neighbours' children, for our own children, for our grandchildren. We bear a responsibility to provide a society that nurtures those young people that embraces those young people, but most of all, never gives up on providing hope for those young people. Now, I, I'm, I'm a great fan of Mr Kennett, and I've met him many times. But when he said a couple of weeks ago that maybe Ben Cousins would be better off in jail, I thought, Jeff, have you ever spent a day in jail? I don't know anyone who's better off for being in jail. Jail is an inevitable consequence of controlling behaviour, absolutely. It's one of the last resorts society has. But let's not be mistaken. The solutions that we provide to long-term drug use are both brutal and ineffective. Over 80% of young people that are in juvenile custody at the moment are there with drug-related issues. That's not my figures, that's the figures from the sentencing board. So we need to think about this. And we need to ask ourselves this one question. How do we want to live as a society? How do we want to understand ourselves as a society? Are we more than just a bunch of individuals selfishly pursuing our own needs and desires? Or are we really a village and a community that says, no matter whose child, that child is a child of ours. Thank you very much. Okay, so what we're gonna do is, um, the panel's gonna talk for a few minutes and then we're gonna open it up to all of you. So remember about the hot seat, remember about the um, microphone, and we'll have a bit of a chat just to get things going. Um, Lisa, I actually th um, thought I'd <laughs> put you in the hot seat, clearly, um, and just start with you. Um, what made you decide to do what I think everyone feels is probably a bit of a brave thing, which is to be quite honest with us about 
of what kind of, you know, that you've been taking illegal drugs? Oh, well, seeing as I wrote a book where I admit to it, I figure I may as well just own it now and get out there. <laughs> what made it, you no decide to write the book? Um, well, it was because I'd, I used to write a column for the Sydney Morning Herald and I'd written a, a column about drug use and the silence around recreational drug use that had got a particularly big response and I was asked to write a book on it. And I thought really hard about whether I wanted to write it because for these exact reasons, I didn't want to stigmatise myself as that drug woman or, uh, and, or anything like that. But the more I thought about it, I thought it was almost this definitive generation gap issue or this definitive issue where there is this silence about people who use recreational drugs occasionally or functionally. Um, and I think I, I felt like I, it was something worth making a point about. Partly because also, also I think when people like me are silent, it does lead to people who end up with disastrous co consequences with drugs being blamed because people think, well, they're idiots. Everyone knows when you try drugs, that's what happens. Uh, and if people can show it's actually a more complex situation, then maybe we can start to stop blaming people for having tried drugs in the first place and understand that there are a lot of complicated reasons why people end up in terrible trouble. Mm. And do, do you feel, um, Peter, that, that in some ways opening up that conversation um, gives us a chance, because I know this is something you did say in your book, Lisa, that, you know, by being silent, we allow the, the very harsh penalties that continue to be around some of the drug use, and that sometimes, do you feel sometimes the harsh penalties are the things that are of the greatest cost to some of the people you see in your service? I think we need to, um, I think we need to stop having shadow conversations and talk about what really goes on, and uh, I think part of the... Uh, Part of the lie that we tell each other in this community is that is that there isn't this world existing out there where sensible, sane people are doing quite risky things, but they aren't destroying their lives. But there are people whose lives are being heavily damaged because of all the reasons that we've talked about tonight, and that this isn't like a this isn't a moral issue. This is just a health issue. And I just, look, you can't have honest conversations with year 12 students about drug use without being accused of promoting drugs. And I, I can tell you now, I'm not a person who wants to promote drugs, but we're caught in this moral dilemma about being able to not tell the truth about drugs for fear it seems like promoting drug use. And as if anyone would want to do that in terms of destroying or harming another person's life. Mm. I, I find it the most insulting thing that's ever been said to me, actually. Mm. So I think, I think the honesty is, is amazing. And I think that's where we've got to start. And if you really want to start with your children, have honest conversations with your children about what really is happening in the world, not what you hope would happen or you wish would happen, but what really is going in and how they're going to navigate that world. Mm. And, and I also hope that by being... Oh, when old people talk about this stuff, honestly, hopefully, like, I hope that I'm actually destroying the glamour of drugs. That's exactly by right. Showing, I've, yeah. You know, plenty of people have been there and done that before you. It's not new. It's not inherently exciting. It's not... Yeah. Uh, yeah, you're not being that much of a rebel. If you want to be a proper rebel, find something much more interesting and original to do. Yeah, we've got to make drugs boring. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> really. I mean, you were, you were nodding your head. I mean, did your parents sit down and have an honest conversation with you? Did somebody? I think that I've been really lucky that my parents have always been quite honest with me and generally talk to me like a person that can understand everything they tell me. And I think that the biggest problem is the lack of information for young people, particularly the information that's out there on... Um, what actually goes into drugs and how drugs can be cut with really harmful filler substances and things. And while even when, you know, when my friend says, I'm going to do this on the weekend, and I say, well, um, well, have you thought about that this could be cut with something else? And until that's really um, out there for everyone to see that information, um, I think that people are going to continue to keep doing it. And where do you think the best place, like where would you have liked to have that information available that it's not available at the moment? Well, I mean, the most obvious place for my generation is on Facebook or social media, but I also think that um, there need to be conversations that happen between people and maybe role models with slightly older people, um, but still in Generation Y maybe talking to us about stories and things like that, because I think that there's not that much out there 
because, again, people are afraid of being stigmatised. And Andrew, I mean, are you comfortable with this? You used that, I, I was very taken by that Russian roulette um, analogy that you used, but it also made me wonder about, um, about the reasons people take drugs. So when, when we sort of, you know, I did that experiment at the beginning where I talked about the harm, you know, sure. composite, and there was a discussion in the paper in which I got that out of where they talked a bit about whether or not they should have made a different kind of composite score because they also should have had the benefits of taking the drug in the composite score. And I thought, whoa, that's, that's pretty controversial. We never talk about the reasons people have for, um, you know, taking drugs. We might say that they're peer pressured or we might say that they're mm. stupid, but we never talk about any kind of good reasons. Do you think there are any good reasons? Drug use is not something that's a recent phenomenon. It's been used by man ever since man has been walking on the earth. Man, you know, for religious rituals, using natural products, you know, the, the Inuit Eskimos in the, uh, in, in the Arctic Circle, there's a, there's a mould that grows on the inside of the igloos, which is a hallucinogen. So someone must have had a lick of the mould and had hallucinations and worked <laughs> out that it wasn't such a bad thing, and people have repeated that, just as people have with, with religious and cultural rituals throughout history. Um, so... You know, the ancient Egyptians, there's good evidence that they used um, marijuana, for example, and opiate use is, goes back to the ancient Babylonians. Yeah. You know, so, so the people had, in history, had very good reasons for drug use. Uh, and it's, it's just that nowadays it's seen as purely recreational rather than having any religious or cultural or medical significance. Right. But, but initially, that's, that's how drug use commenced. Uh, you know, from a cultural, in the, in the human population, from, you know, cultural reasons, religious reasons, medical reasons. And then, you know, one of the things that, for example, spread the use of opiates recreationally was the American Civil War. And it was, it was recently, you know, the, the analgesic efficacy of morphine or opium was, was really found out not that, I mean, okay, the ancient Egyptians used it, but it fell away. And then the use of it medically for, you know, uh, battlefield wounds was used quite extensively during the American Civil War and as a consequence there was a, a big spike in opiate, recreational opiate use after that. Mm. So you can see events in history that, that lead to spikes in recreational drug use even when the drug use, sorry, wasn't used for recreational purposes during that event or as a consequence of that event. And what about you, Peter? I mean, you, you, you spoke so passionately. Do you feel threatened by the idea that we might also open up a conversation to talk about good reasons or, you know, reasons that aren't kind of stigmatised about why people use oh, drugs, or do you think it's dangerous? No, no, I don't think it's dangerous. I think it's exactly what's needed. I mean, don't misinterpret my passion. My passion is not about the drug. My passion is about the way we treat drug users. And... Um, one of the things I first saw when I worked in St Kilda years and years ago was that you would walk down Fitzroy Street and you would see, um, and I don't mean to be at all rude about the police, but you would see police making young women and young men take their clothes off while they searched them for drugs. And good citizens would walk past and see this and they would look and they would, they would be shocked. Like, why is that woman lifting up the top of her dress why is that man having to take his pants down around his ankles? Mm. And they'd turn to each other in a knowing moment and they'd say, junkies. And they'd be okay. They'd be okay with it. Suddenly they'd understand. This is what we should do to these people. And I used to think, and I don't want to be emotive here, but I will be, this must have been what it was like for people in Nazi Germany when they were identified as Jews. Society was okay to stigmatise. Or in different societies where being gay was, 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 uh, was frowned upon or seen as, a, as, a, as some sort of horrific situation. I think we've got a long way to go around. How can you help people that you stigmatise and blame? They won't come to you for help. And that's I, what we do. I agree completely. I mean, I I have um, a, a good analogy as well, to, which is why at the start of my speech um, or my conversation, I, I made the, the, the kind of the, the push that we don't think it's a moral issue and scientists don't think it's a moral issue at all. It's, it's a medical issue. And I've, I've had a letter from a member of the public. They wrote to me after there was some publicity about one of 
uh, one of my research findings in the publications. Uh, and I still have this letter. And the, the gist of it was, um, I'm wasting taxpayers' money. I should be researching a cure for Parkinson's disease. That would be far more worthwhile. Uh, I don't have a conscience because I'm working on addiction. I shouldn't be able to sleep at night. And, uh, and I should stop doing what I'm doing immediately because everybody knows these people can just stop if they want to. And not only did they write me a letter, but they wrote the director of the institute a letter telling the director of the institute that what is he thinking of having me in his institute spending money researching into the mechanisms behind addiction when I should be doing something that's far more worthwhile and a far better way to spend taxpayers' dollars? I still have the letter. Mm. I never replied to it. So we want to blame, we want to stigmatise, and this will be the last question I'll put to you and then I'll open it up. Why do we want to blame and stigmatise? I mean, if it's so counterproductive, and it seems to me that's what everyone's saying, it's counterproductive, why do we do it? Fear and ignorance, I think. Any ideas over there? Girls? Sounds about right. And also <laughs> because uh, part of it is that intergenerational silence. Some of the, say, baby boomers or older people who might be saying that, it's often on the assumption that it is only... Uh, troubled youths or yes. losers who are doing it. They don't realise their own kids are doing it or their friends' kids yes. are doing it. And if their friends' kids are doing it, they only hear about it when something goes terribly wrong. They don't realise that everyone else they haven't heard about, well, like a significant minority of the kids they haven't heard about are also doing it. The what I think is that there's a big distinction between getting drunk with your friends or getting high with your friends and sitting alone at home and downing a bottle of pills or taking cough medicine or something. And so I think that's, that's a big difference as well. Taking drugs socially or taking drugs by, by yourself is very different. Okay. Okay, so as everybody's seen, the hot seat has arrived. Um, I can see that I've got a questioner over there, so I'm gonna turn to him first, but the hot seat beckons. So whoever would like to be here, would you like to actually join us here as the sixth member of our panel? Okay. <laughs> we won't take that personally. Okay, what's your question? My question uh, was for Andrew. You're obviously a researcher, but have you given thought to what you think would be actually the, the best um, medical or evidence-based um, drugs policy if you could put, implement one free from the social context? So just from a purely medical standpoint, mm -hmm. what do you think would be or make an effective drugs policy? Yeah, well, I mean, not being a, a treatment provider, it, it's not something that... I've spent a lot of time thinking of, but I will say a few things that prohibition clearly doesn't work. That's one thing. Education works. L legalizing, you know, the, the, the majority of funds that are spent on so-called addiction in this country are spent on the, the criminal justice system and the uh, border security, if you like. Now, that's been the case for decades and decades and decades, and nothing's changed. We, we haven't we haven't solved the drug abuse situation because that's not the root cause of the substance abuse situation. So we need to, as has been discussed, identify the causes for drug use, what drives people to use drugs, and they may be different for different people. Not, not everyone uses drugs, for, or even if you take a particular drug, different people will have a different reason for using it in the first place. Um, as we've discussed. So I think the, the causes and the precipitants of drug use have to be identified. And, and then these people have to be uh, nurtured and ed not only educated, but provided with an environment where they feel safe and secure as well. So uh, I'm not against the notion of safe injecting houses, for example. Uh, I mean, I don't know the, the legalities of it, but in principle, there's no, if, if people are going to use drugs, they should use them in a safe environment, in, in an environment where if something does happen, if there is an adverse consequence, there is some immediate remedial action available. That, that, that's, that's a belief. From a treatment perspective, it's very difficult because it's not even clear whether they, there is an absolute treatment uh, and, and whether or not the treatment is pharmacological, is behavioural, is a combination of those. Different strategies may or may not work for different people for different amounts of time. And some people may be able to be completely treated, but it depends on what you define as recovery and what you define as treatment. That, that's from, from a, this, I mean, clinicians may disagree, and I'm, I'm quite happy to have that discussion, but from a naive scientific perspective, that, that's, that's my viewpoint. 
Um, gentleman over there. We've spoken about substances. Mm -hmm. Clearly the personality is addictive and I'm thinking about practices like gambling mm -hmm. and I know for myself whenever I pass the computer and I'm not thinking of something in particular, it's solitaire and it wastes mm -hmm. a tremendous amount of time. Um, and there's, um, what was the other thing? Uh, the effect on infants with their little, little computer machines. Yes. Um, now you've spoken about substances that you can investigate in animals. Mm -hmm. Can you do the same investigation in animals with gambling and with uh, computer machines uh, for, for, for youngsters that would... The, the feeling is that these things already damage brain function at that yep. little age. Thank you. So, so the short answer is it's not easy to, to model uh, internet games in animals, but you can model gambling and you, animals will gamble. So you can give animals a, a, a low risk, low return option or a high risk, high return option and they, some animals will, will gamble. So you can, you can do what is equivalent to gambling type experiments in animals. Um, I think the important thing is though, while, while I was talking about substance abuse, it, it's it's a broader problem. I mean, we know, for example, in work that we've done, looking at the, the circuits in the brain and the chemicals in the brain that are driving drug seeking, if you like, that there's a very strong overlap with the circuitry behind uh, food intake and, and the choice of what food intake you take. And, and so it's becoming increasingly apparent that there's, there's much more overlap, not a complete overlap, but there's more overlap than was realized, say, a decade ago in, in the pathways in the brain that are behind eating disorders as well as substance abuse disorders, for example. So, so th there are many parallels there. Do you think oh. we're uncomfortable with the idea of dependence or addiction, whatever word you think is the right word to use, in and of itself, yeah. even if, for argument's sake, there was no harm connected to being addicted to the computer? That's right. And, and I guess I, I was going to come to that because the... the psychiatrist's holy grail is called the Diagnostic Statistic Manual, which is a... a, a a manual of diagnostic criteria written by the, a, a group of people but under the umbrella of the American Psychiatric Association. And the current, which is called the DSM-4, or the version 4 of the Diagnostic Statistic Manual, uh, has dependence as one of the diagnostic characteristics of, of drug addiction. Whereas the, there's a new version about to come out called DSM-5, not surprisingly. And the definitions are going to be broadened to incorporate eating disorders, yes. uh, sex addiction, if you like, internet gambling. So to encompass compulsive behaviour more broadly. And I think that's right. I mean, there are differences, but there are clear similarities and overlaps and parallels within the, the pathways in the brain that are driving those similar but still different behaviours. But can I throw this to you just for a minute, Peter? I mean, it, it, what if you're com a compulsive giver? What if you, you know, compulsively give money to charity? Is that bad? <laughs> <laughs> I'll send them your uh, way later. I'd say it depends on the charity. But, um, uh, no, look, I, I think this is where it becomes a really moral relativism. And, uh, I, I'm, I, look, I'm also not comfortable with, um, with such a reductionist argument around looking at particular behaviours. I think we've got to look more broadly through a different prism, and that's the prism of what's actually going on for the person and what harms are occurring to both them and the community that they're living in. And clearly, um, uh, the gentleman that spoke before, although he's wasted a lot of time playing solitaire on the computer, um, he doesn't look that badly off for doing it. And uh, I'm not sure many people have suffered as a result of his solitaire behaviour. And so, Look, I think we've got to be careful about spreading the net too wide, and we haven't got enough time for me to tell you what I think about DSM-4 <laughs> and but, 5. But, for instance, Min, you, you, I think, made reference to this too. You were speaking a little bit about, you know, as somebody who didn't want to feel um, like you were um, attached to anything. So do you think that that's good in it itself, just to not be attached to anything, even if that thing is not necessarily bad? I just think that you have to... Sorry. I just think that you have to look at how much people are thinking um, when they choose to, to behave in a certain way. So the compulsive act aspect of behaviour, if they're not using their thought processes anymore when they 
um, choose to behave in a certain way, I think that's where it can get dangerous. We've got someone in the hot seat. I'm so excited. Who are you? Um, my name is Sabi McDonnell, and I'm a mother of four with lots of experience, so I thought yes. I'd like to say something. Well, good, please. Take it away. No? Yes. It's quite a bit. Oh, all right. Well, I, I think you need to keep it a little bit short. Uh, yeah, but well, but pick, um, one of the, pick the most important thing you want to yeah, say, and let's start with that. I just want to say that and I don't have any, any big papers, um, you know, uh, to prove that I've done something, but I've got experience. Okay. And you cannot buy experience. Uh, I have worked from primary school in everything in primary school. I have worked with street kids. I have worked with um, asylum seekers and refugees, so I've done it all. Uh, I can ma mention everything. Um, and I have been a teacher, a nurse, an interpreter, a social worker. So it, I think experience counts for a lot. And um, I think what is missing in the world at the moment is love. You mentioned nurturing all that sort of thing, but love is the most important because the uh, basis of the world is, is put on love. So because this love is missing, a lot of our children don't get enough of it. And when, when you're not loved, then you just get lost in this world and you go looking for something to compensate that love and often that what you find is drug, alcohol, murder, whatever. And instead of putting our young people, children, in prison, but we don't put children in prison, but young people, we should love them, we should give them things to do, uh, things like art, music, because these are the food for the soul. That's what's happening to them. Their the soul has, has become tired. If, we, if they go into the world of music, painting, the, the, the spirit is going to start reviving again. That's what they need. They don't need prison. Prison only makes hard criminals. Okay, let's let, let's let them respond. Does anyone want to say something to that? No, oh, I couldn't agree more. I think that's basically you're just reiterating what we've been saying. Yeah, I, I also totally agree. I, I, in fact, if I was in charge of addressing the drug problem, if you look at the groups that are most likely to end up in, with serious problems with drugs, three things I'd address are, one, child abuse, two, homophobia, and three, mental health. Mm. Uh, um, and in particular, that, that, that last, last point of mental health, there's so much concern about you know, medicating children for mental health problems and whatever, but I think that that it is so important to seek help for children who do have mental health problems and young people who do have mental health problems, whether it's through medication or therapy, because the last thing you want is for those children to have their first experience of peace in their whole lives to be with recreational drugs. You mean because they're self-medicating, is that what yeah, you're saying? exactly, exactly. Yeah. Right. People, uh, young people seek what everyone seeks. They seek normality. They want to feel centred. They want to feel within themselves that they're, they're okay. And I can't tell you how many young people have told me over the years who have serious issues with drugs that their main driving um, desire is to feel normal. And the only time they believe they feel normal is when they're using drugs. And I remember asking a young woman one day, I said, when did you know that you were getting into trouble with your drug use? She said, the first time I took the drug I felt like this is how I should always feel. And I knew that I'd always be going back to that drug. Are you a questioner over there? Thank you so much. Thank you. You, you actually asked the question when I first came up to the microphone about um, can you be addicted to giving, um, which in a sense was, was where I was coming from. And then I thought probably I need to make a comment more than ask a question. But, um, I'm sorry I stole your question. That's okay, that's okay. Um, it's just that from the various comments that have been made and from my experience, um, I feel that we tend to stigmatise um, lots of people who are involved around caring for those who 
have ha had a hard time accepting that they are cared for and, and that the lack of love that exists somewhere um, in their life um, often can't be filled by someone else no matter how much they want to do it. Um, partly I say that from being a foster carer, partly I say it from being a mother. Um, my, my own daughter at the age of 13 became addicted to heroin. Um, she was, uh, my husband and I had split up, she was living with him for a while. He kicked her out of home at 13. She ended up on the streets and, and got into heroin. And part of it was that she felt she couldn't live with me because it would be a betrayal of him to be with me. So I was going out in the streets, talking with her, talking with her friends, allowing her to bring her friends home. When I saw her, it was never just her. It was at least six other people staying in my house every time I needed to see her and know that she was okay. By the time things got to going to the children's court for stealing and all sorts of things for keeping her habit going, she was involved with a, a, a young man as well who was out on the street with her. And the whole process at the children's court was the youth workers didn't want her boyfriend to be involved. They didn't want him to be staying in the house with me. I knew that if I didn't let him stay, she wouldn't be able to stay. The only way I could do what she needed was to give her enough space around her and her whole circle to say that all of them were welcome, all of them were understood, all of them were cared for, all of them were loved. And it just about ripped me apart, but I survived it. Good on you. When I say it just about ripped me apart, this was the hardest thing I had to say to her. The day she was about to go into drug rehab, but for a week she and her boyfriend hadn't been talking to me. I just couldn't stand that we weren't talking anymore when we'd been so open to each other. And that morning I said to her, do you know how much I feel like killing you right now? I was amazed at myself for not saying, I feel like killing you. What I did was I asked her a question to recognise I had feelings too. And that to me was the breakthrough moment that said, I can't give any more unless I get something back. I am not codependent. I am not giving too much. I am being who I need to be so that we all get through this together. And that to me is what, when, when um, Lisa says the first chapter of the book, The Silence, to me that is the kind of conversation we have to say. We have to stop being afraid of admitting how much each and every one of us hurts. And each and every one of us is hurt by these kinds of behaviours and splitting of atoms over what is the issue and what's not the issue and bring the love back into it. Thank you very much for sharing your story. And we've got our last person because we're going to need to wind up soon, so I think this will be our last hot seat question. Welcome. What's your name? Hi, I'm Andrea. And Hi, Andrea. And we're both at the... Atheist Convention Gala, and we coordinated our outfits for tonight. Um, I guess I wanted to start off by saying that I'm a student of alcohol and drug work at TAFE, and beyond that, I have a mental illness myself. I'm a manic depressive, and we are a much maligned section of the community, the mentally ill, but there is one section of the community that is worse off than us, and that is the drug-using community. And I think part of the problem is, is that there's uh, this idea of volition. You are choosing to take that, you are choosing to put that needle in your vein, therefore you are choosing to destroy your life, and good luck to you, I think, is the problem. And I think 
inherently people have a desire to live a good life, to be happy and to be healthy. And, and part of what is the problem with both mental illness and drug and alcohol services is that there is just not enough of them. And there's not this idea of integrative and, dare I say it, holistic treatment. And I really am excited by the research that Andrew is doing around neuroscience and, and neurobiology. I think it's incredibly important, but I, I am a little bit concerned when the idea that these things, there is a d disease model that the idea that there are more kind of broad ways of, or integrative ways of fixing these problems. So I just, I guess I wondered about how we could present people with all the tools that they needed, which may be a medication or some type of medical treatment, but may also be an education program or rehab or how do, how do we provide this to Fantastic. <laughs> Peter. I totally agree. Totally agree. And uh, one size does not fit all. And this is a complex issue that re requires really complex and smart solutions. And it's going to be holistic. Not one thing fixes everything. Andrew, did you want to oh, say that, something? That's, that's exactly what I said in, in, in my conversation and, and the subsequent questions, that even if you look at it from a treatment perspective, there's going to be a range of treatment options because not everybody's going to respond favourably to the same treatment. And whether those treatments are medical or, or behavioural, some people will respond to one or both or others. And even within the range of medical treatments, uh, some people may respond to one therapy but not another and, and vice versa. So we need a broad suite of options available to us and we should not be afraid of trying any option, no matter how much evidence there is or isn't behind it. Because if we don't try, you're never going to get any evidence without trying. So I think we need to be very open-minded about what, what may be, for some people, an effective solution. And that's the important thing, is that you don't need to think you're going to provide a magic bullet that's going to cure all addictions. But even if you help 10 or 15 or 20 percent, you've made a big difference with that one particular strategy. So it's like chipping away. and uh, and increasing the, the, the range of options available so that hopefully there becomes options that, that people do respond to. And I think that's actually a great note to, to leave on because I think the one message that's come across tonight is that it's really not one size fits all. It's not one size fits all in terms of what we do and it's not one size fits all in terms of how we respond to what we do mm. and it's not one size fits all in terms of the solutions for those of us who get into trouble. So I, I want to thank you all for being such an attentive and involved audience. I want to remind you on your way out that if you'd like you can sign up and, and get some more information about more Melbourne conversations. And I want to please ask you to thank all of our guests, um, Andrew, Lisa, Mim, and Peter. I'm Leslie Cannell. Thank you very much for coming tonight. See ya.